Thank you. Good morning and welcome to this Gibbs Flash Forum in what is going to be a particularly important and a necessary conversation, not only for us here in South Africa, in broader Africa, but also a topic that I think is particularly relevant and important for everybody across the world. When I received the request from my colleague, J.D. Bossman, to chair this forum, I jumped at the opportunity because it's a topic that's particularly close to my heart. Uh, it's an area that I have thought about quite extensively throughout my career, given the dynamics and the history of South Africa as a country, uh, given the difficulty that many of us have faced in different parts of our workspaces, but also very importantly, given the nature and way in which my guest today, Ms. Carice Anderson, has written this book. And so in the last five days, uh, Carice, I've done quite a bit of speed reading. I've taken the opportunity to jump into your book, but I loved it on Sunday, uh, having finished quite a bit of it. And I've made extensive amount of notes in this book. And I loved two things that have come out from this book. One, the very practical way in which you've written it. And you speak quite extensively in the book in terms of uh, the way you move from a victim mindset into an enabling mindset. And so for me, that was something that I took out quite significantly. But before we do that, I want to welcome all of you to the Splash Forum today. But I want to make a special mention also to my guest, Ms. Carice Anderson. Uh, Carice holds an MBA from Harvard University. Carice, I'm currently doing my GMP at Harvard, and it's fascinating to read through so many cases every evening, uh, to have case discussions, uh, to look at the Socratic method of learning. And so it's an area that we share, but we also share an interest in terms of the consulting world. I see that you've worked extensively with many consulting firms. And thirdly, uh, Carice, I see that we share an interest in terms of leadership development. So I really look forward to spending some time with you. Uh, I chatted to Carice yesterday and said, I could introduce you, but I actually want to take uh, a leaf from your book where you talk about telling your story mm. and the importance of bringing that story to the workplace. So I want to open up by actually giving you the floor to give us a sense of your background. You've had an interesting both professional but also personal career. You've had a very interesting link with Southern Africa, both from a marriage perspective, but also from a work perspective. And so let me open up by inviting you to share with us your story and your background and where you are today, and then what led to, to you writing this book. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abdullah, for your introduction, and thank you, Gibbs, for hosting me. Um, so I am American, as you all can hear, um, but I've been living in South Africa for almost 10 years. Um, but I grew up, obviously, in the States. I, I grew up in Alabama, which is in the southern part of the U.S., and I would say my, you know, my formative years really comprised kind of four themes for me. It was family, education, spirituality, and music. Um, so I come from a very close-knit family. I mean, the kind of family where we see each other all the time, you know, every day, every Sunday, we're together for church and for dinner. Um, you know, my father is actually a minister, and I just come from, you know, a long line of very, you know, spiritual and very faith-based people. And so, you know, the church. I'm Christian. That played a huge part uh, in my growing up. Um, you know, I was a complete and total nerd. I will admit it that that's the school part. <laughs> I can remember being so excited to learn how to read when I was five. I don't know if I've been that excited about anything since, but uh, but yeah, that the school was a huge part, I think, of my identity, which I also talk about later in the book. Um, and I would say the fourth part, like I said, was music. My, I come from a very musical family. My grandmother sang, my mother sings, plays the organ. I took piano lessons for over a decade, can't play a lick, but it was a huge, <laughs> it was a huge component of my growing up. Um, and so, you know, after I graduated from, from high school and was getting ready to start college, you know, people were advising me, people were saying, you know, don't do this. You should, you know, do pick a major where you can make some money after you graduate. Because I come from a family of teachers, social workers, and ministers. And, you know, I wanted to major in psychology and music, but people were like, no, don't do that. You know, so I ended up majoring in business. And, you know, that was pretty much the, the plan. I didn't really have a lot of advice, to be honest, because it, I was totally kind of out of the the, the norm in terms of my family, in terms of where people focused, right? So I literally chose a major in less than five minutes without doing any research. 
<laughs> and I, was, I, was, I literally went down the list. I was like, management, no. Economics, no. Finance, no. Okay, marketing. That's what I'm, that was literally my process to choose my major. And, okay. and, you know, the, and then I graduated and I started my career pretty much as clueless as I was in undergrad. So I, 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 try, I try to share a lot of that in the book so that other people don't necessarily make the same mistakes that I made. Fantastic. And so that, uh, that was really the issue of studying uh, the motivation. Uh, I find another common interest. I also never knew what I wanted to study, became a lawyer and decided that I don't really want to be a lawyer. And uh, it's interesting, you know, in terms of young people. Uh, you then went on to, to have a corporate career, right? Uh, firstly, obviously, Absolutely. doing your MBA at, HB, at Harvard Business School, then a corporate career. So talk to us a little bit around that transition. And then what brought you to South Africa in the last 10 years? So I'd like to divide my career into kind of three parts. There was the, the phase of my career before business school, the phase of my career after business school, and then my career since I've been living in South Africa. So in that first phase, I worked um, for three companies, actually. I worked for, it was at the time, it was Hewitt Associates, but now it's been, it's merged with Aon. So it's Aon Hewitt. Um, you know, and, and because I think I was so totally clueless, you know, I ended up in a job that was not a good fit for me at all. I was actually a technology tester. Go figure, how did a marketing major end up being a technology tester? <laughs> but I'll tell you how I ended up in that job, Abdullah. My whole goal out of undergrad was I need to earn enough money so I can be independent. I had been you know, on my own technically for four years away at, at university. And I was like, I can't go back home and have a curfew. You know, So that was driving all of my decisions, to be honest. Um, my first probably three jobs in undergrad. Out of undergrad, it was all about finances. And so I, Hewitt was hiring and they were offering free breakfast, free lunch, free dinner, <laughs> um, free parking and free benefits. Wow. <laughs> and, so, and so to a 22 year old who doesn't really grasp the concept of, you know, you're gonna have to work this job. It's gonna be long hours. I, I'm just thinking about the benefits. I'm just thinking about all the free things I'm gonna get. So I took so the job and, you know, to no surprise, I was not happy. And so I had a friend who was working at Arthur Anderson at the time. And she said, well, look, we do something similar, but it doesn't have the technology component. Why don't you interview here? So that's what I did. You know? And so my plan was, okay, I'm going to go to Arthur Anderson where I feel like people are a bit more seasoned. Because when I was at Hewitt, my manager was like two years older than me. So I thought she can't really help me figure out what I want to be when I grow up. She's still figuring herself out. So I wanted to go to Anderson. I felt like people were more experienced. And I thought to myself, I'll stay at Arthur Anderson until I figure out what I want to be when I grow up. Well, we all know Anderson collapsed while I was there. <laughs> so um, as part of you know everything that happened, Deloitte ended up assuming parts of Anderson in the US. And my group was one of the groups that they took on. So that's how I ended up at Deloitte. Um, and, you know, I, I felt like I was getting closer with every job I had. I was getting closer and closer to where I actually wanted to be. But when I was at Deloitte, I started thinking about going back to school. I thought I would actually work in the nonprofit. And I think a lot of that goes back to my family background. Um, you know, we didn't necessarily work in for-profit organizations, but I just felt like they felt a greater connection to what they were doing than I did in the roles right. I had had. Um, and so I went to business school, had an amazing transformational experience. I mean, you can you can attest to that, I'm sure, um, from, from the exposure that you had to Harvard. Had an amazing experience. I met my husband while I was there. He, we we okay. weren't dating at that time, but I did meet him there. Uh, he's a year ahead of me at HBS. And then- well, That was you know, a great came... return from, uh, from, your, uh, from your HBS uh, fees, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I got a husband and a degree out of the deal. So I, I feel like that, that ROI was, was pretty high there. <laughs> so, you know, after I, after I left business school, I ended up going back to Deloitte. I really discovered I had a passion for people while I was at business school. And Deloitte was one of the top companies that, that was operating in that space. So I went back there. But then also while I was at business school, I had discovered a fellowship program for people who worked in the private sector, but who wanna work in public education. Right. And so I ended up leaving Deloitte and joining that. I li literally joined a school district and was working in public. I worked in public education for three years, but kind of during that time, my husband and I started dating, got married. And so then I moved to South Africa. 
Um, and then once I moved to South Africa, I started working at McKinsey. I was working in professional development. So the way McKinsey is structured is that human resources does benefits, admin, payroll, and professional right. development does everything else related to people. So we staff people on studies, we coach people, we give feedback. I ran a leadership development program for early career Black South Africans. And, you know, actually that experience really ignited that passion in me for leadership development and made me actually start realizing, you know, what ultimately would become my book. But this idea that young Black talent, you know, we have the intellectual horsepower, we have the pedigree, but we don't necessarily have, we don't have that, some of those soft skills or the, or the understanding of the importance of those soft skills in order to be successful. So that's probably where the, the spark may have been lit to even write my book was the conversations that I would have with, with those individuals who were in the program. Um, after I left McKinsey, I went to go work for what I call a, a start down because it never really started up. And <laughs> I was there for eight months. And then I started uh, working, you know, as a small business owner, I was doing, you know, um, I was doing actually leadership consulting, facilitation, coaching, and then I also was running a natural hair business on the side, which is a whole other conversation. And then I joined uh, Corn Ferry at the end of 2019, right. and I've been there ever since. And for those of you that may not know Corn Ferry, it's a global organizational strategy consulting firm. We specialize in leadership development diversity and inclusion, succession, assessments, um, job evaluation and grading. We do all things related to people. Oh, fantastic. So I think a really interesting view in terms of the three parts to your career. I think the first is obviously Anderson, the positioning towards Deloitte, uh, the work yeah. that you did at Deloitte, the move towards HBS and the MBA, which as you said, was probably life-changing in many ways, as we've discussed, and then the coming back and then come to South Africa. And South Africa, obviously you've been here for 10 years, we now 25 years into democracy. But one of the things, as you rightly say, is that uh, many people of color have grappled with this issue where, as you rightly title it, intelligence isn't enough, right? And so one of the things that often comes through in, in my classes at Gibbs, in my conversations with different executives, is exactly this point that there's some softer skills that uh, I think many people of color grapple with. Talk us through some of those softer skills and before you go ahead, Carrie, so I'm going to ask uh, members of the audience, please feel free to put questions into the conversation. If you want to raise your hand, I'll give you an opportunity to come into the room with me or even put a chat out there. I want to keep the session as engaging, as interactive as possible. So any burning questions, any inputs from your side, please feel free to either use the Q&A or the chat or even raise your hand and I'll be able to manage all three. Thank you. So I think some of those softer skills, and I mean, this is also part of the reason I directed my book at Black professionals, but I do think even if you're not a Black professional, you can get a lot of value out of the book. Or if you're yep. managing young Black professionals, I think it'll give you a, a window into, into how they think. I think one of the first things is that, you know, growing up, I think a lot of Black people are told, you know, be excellent. You know, you have this high standard for yourself. But nobody ever tells you that you're going to be excellent with and through and for other people. Excellence does not happen in a vacuum. And I think that's that's one of the main messages, right, that I think leads people into believing, oh, you know, I don't need anybody to be successful. I can do this all on my own, right? As opposed to understanding, no, yes, you come in with the, with the degrees and you come in with the intelligence, but you need people to coach you, to mentor you, to sponsor you. Right. You need people to show you how this environment works. Um, and if you go in with this, you know, I call it the go it alone mentality in my book. If you go into it with that mentality, it does. It doesn't work. I think the second thing is also, you know, when you're in university and probably even, you know, school before then, you never have to really get along with people to get good grades. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, you don't even yeah. have to have a good relationship with your professor to get good grades. I mean, I, I was cum laude out of undergrad and I never had a relationship with any of my professors. <laughs> but that that <laughs> that mentality does not work in a corporate space. Sure. You have to have good relationships with people. You've got to learn how to get along with different kinds of people who are different than you. You've got to learn how to resolve conflict. Um, and so those are skills that a lot of times no one ever teaches us. You know, and yeah. they are critical 
to, you know, because obviously when you, it's great to bring all these different people together, but there's also that tension from the difference. So how, what, who's giving us the skills to uh, kind of manage through that conflict and manage through that tension so we can get to the other side? You know, in there's fact, not as you're talking, you know, it reminds me of, in, in your book, you speak about these two comparisons, what you think you need to have impact. And I think what many of our parents have told us, you know, mm. we grow up in a system where it's all about yeah. to get ahead, make sure that you, as you put it here, have a degree and a qualification, that you work hard and you have the requisite technical skills. You then juxtapose that with what you actually need. How do you know yourself? The hard work, the technical skills and the degrees are important, they're 25% of it. It's how do you know your environment and how mm. do you know others? And those other Absolutely. three are things that we never get taught, right, at school. Exactly. Talk me through a little bit of that. So, I mean, the, the, the framework I use in the book is, you know, like you just mentioned, I, I believe that maximum impact is kind of at the intersection of you knowing yourself, knowing other people and knowing your environment. And then I feel like because of the knowledge of those three, you can really craft a personal brand and a communication style that allows you to have maximum impact. Um, and I, you know, I think, like you said, a lot of people, we just don't know that. We don't know. We think it's all about, you know, we think 75% of it is intellect and degrees and qualifications, where it's actually the reverse. You know, yeah. nobody has ever asked me once I've started a job, you know, or giving me, given me opportunities because I went to HBS. You know, like <laughs> people are like, that's great. We, you know, we value your education, but, you know, that's not, that's not the be all end all. And even if you look at the Center for Creative Leadership, which I mentioned their formula in the book too, you know, when you think about how you're going to learn how to be good at your job, 10% of it is formal training, 20% of it is learning from other people, and 70% of it is on the job training. That's, yeah. so, you know, when you come in the door, you're coming basically with the 10% and maybe not even that much. Right. So, I mean, you, you, the other 90% is coming from other people and from on the job experiences. And so I, I need people to really grasp that and to understand, you know, there's so much that you don't know and you need to save some of your energy, you know, to put towards those areas that, you know, you haven't been as exposed to or don't have as much experience in. So, so that leads me, I mean, in the book, you speak about the F word, right? Not the F word that you in the audience think we're speaking about. The F word. <laughs> <laughs> being fear, right? And that's yeah. obviously, you know, one of the other cultural factors that we face is our history as South Africa has created yeah. quite a bit of residual fear. I mean, I know I grew up in a family uh, that was quite active in terms of, uh, you know, apartheid. And so you were, you were brought up with a very racial view of the world. And so you have Absolutely. this uh, perspective. And how do you break some of that inherent fear or even unconscious bias that sets into you as an individual? You know, it, it's interesting. I mean, I tell a story in the book when I was at Arthur Anderson, at one point I was the only black consultant on the entire floor. And there were other black employees, but they were all assistants or secretaries. And people often used to mistake me for like a, for an assistant or a secretary. And I think because of that, you know, how I had grown up, I mean, I grew up very racially aware. I mean, you understand that, right? You're always aware that people might have an issue with you because of what you look like. And so when I entered into that space, I just started feeling this tremendous pressure to represent all Black people. You know, I was like, everything I say needs to be profound and insightful, <laughs> you know, because if I say the wrong thing, they might question if they, need, if they should hire more Black people, you know, yeah. or, or if hiring me was a mistake. And what I found for me was that it just started to paralyze me. To be honest, right. I was paralyzed. I wasn't, nothing that I had to say at 24 meant that bar you know, of being so insightful and so impactful, you know, so I ended up really silencing myself. And I realized one day I was just like, this isn't fair to me. You know, I would look at like one of my white coworkers and think he doesn't feel the same pressure that, that I feel. If he messes up, he's messing up for himself, not 1.2 billion other black people, you know? So I was like, why should I carry so much of a burden just because I happen to be born black? And for me, pretty much from that point on, I would say I just started speaking up and I just I said to myself, you know what, maybe everything I won't I, I'll say won't be so smart, but it's OK. Like I'm young, I'm still learning. Um, and if people want to judge all black people by, you know, the silly thing that I might say, then that says more about them than it does about me. And I think for me, that helped me just relax 
be more authentic. And I actually think my relationships got better because I just showed up as a real person. Right. So, so maybe, I mean, I want to talk about this burden because yesterday I chatted to a few friends and colleagues who, you know, in anticipation of me preparing for the session and I asked them, what are some of their challenges? And for them, I think the burden or the pressure, especially being the first people in their family to get a degree, the first yeah. people to go into the workforce. And then what we've become accustomed to knowing in South Africa is black tax, the responsibility of yeah. people way beyond your own self places that burden that you don't speak of. You, you want to assimilate you want yeah. to just integrate rather than to be able to bring your authentic self, your voice. And, you know, one of them said something very interesting to, to me. They said, the moment I walk through the doors, I put up a new face. And that face yeah. is one yeah. of just fitting in. And I don't really be authentic. I mean, how do you manage that polarity of the mm. fear, uh, the F word as we call it, versus the need to be authentic and the necessity yeah. of it, I think. So one of the concepts I talk about in my book is this idea about the continuum of authenticity, because I heard a lot of young people say to me, you know, Carries, I can't be fake. Like I am who I am, you know, and I, and I, I wanted to help them understand. I don't think it's one thing or the other. I think there's a continuum of authenticity and you have to, you have to figure out when you look at your environment and you look at the people that you're trying to get your message across, where on that spectrum you know, make sense for you to kind of exist in that moment, right? So one of the one of the things I talk about is, you know, if the people from your home, and I'll use myself as an example, like I'm a loud, boisterous kind of person. I love to crack jokes. I'm sarcastic as all get out, <laughs> you know? So that's probably me on level 10. So that's how I am with my closest friends, my family. Now, am I necessarily going to be that way at work? No, I'm probably going to tone myself down to a level six or a level seven. Right. If I'm on a job interview, I'm probably going to be like a level three or a level four. Right. But I think I need to be recognizable. Like, so if my family came to see me at the job interview or to see me with my colleagues, I would hope that they recognize me in some way, shape or form. Like, okay, this is Carrie. She's a little bit toned down, but I still recognize her. And the same thing for the people who work with me. If they came you know, to my house with my family and my closest friends, I would hope they would recognize me. So for me, it's about existing on that continuum, because at the end of the day, it's not just about just being authentic. I also think you want to think about getting your message across to people, you know, yeah. and everybody can't handle Carice on level 10. Right. So I have to tone it down a little bit so that people can receive what it is that I'm <laughs> saying, because for me, that's what's most important is getting my message across um, and kind of striking the balance between being authentic, but also getting that message across to the people I'm talking to. So, so one of the things in your book you speak about is the need to find a commonality or to build relationships with people who are different to you, whether it be yeah. from a generational perspective or from ethnicity or gender. And you know, you speak about the fact that you have to be able to find ways to connect. And this is Absolutely. the ability to get common understanding, to get empathy. And so this issue of Abdullah builder being a 10 at his home in terms of having an extended family versus having a six in the place of work uh, how do you start to bring your authentic self, even if it's that six, uh, practically, what are ways in which we can create workplaces that are a lot more aware, empathetic, mm. and understanding of each other? I think for me, that's something that we've got to do more of in the workplace. You know, there's a saying, I don't know who said it, it's not my quote, but I, it's, it's something like you need to seek to understand before you are understood. And honestly, I think that's one of the keys is us. And I talk about this in my book about being curious about other people, yeah. you know, about listening to other people, tapping into what other people care about. And then I think eventually people start caring and, and asking you about what it is you care about. But I think it has to be, you know, I think we have to extend that, that understanding before we can ask to be understood, to be honest. Um, yeah, and I think, right. you know, it's like I, when I worked in public education, we used to say, Kids only, um, kids care about what you know once they know you care about them, right? Lovely, lovely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and what I realized one day is I was like, oh my goodness, adults just grow up from being children. <laughs> so they're the same way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, ki you know, kids, kids, I, I think we need to remember that, that we're all still children at heart on some levels, right? And we want people to care about us as people. And so I think if we can start doing that for other people, then I think other people will reciprocate for us as well. 
Um, and for me, I think that's one of the biggest ways to, you know, to try to bridge that gap. Because I know it's hard. It is hard. And I, even for myself, like I've been in environments where I'm this, you know, Black woman trying to build relationships with an older white man who, you know, EQ doesn't seem that high. They're not that personable. They're not that approachable. And I'm like, how do I do this? And I just started tapping in. I started asking people, so, okay, well, you know, how are your kids? And the person's face lights up when they talk about the children. You know, I had one partner I used to work with. He loved Burning Man. So I would talk to him about Burning Man. <laughs> I mean, you know, so you find what people care about and that's, you start to build that relationship on that basis. And I think the, the flip side of it too is that we've got to find things that we're willing to share about ourselves too. Because I've heard yeah. a lot of Black people talk about, you know, when you go to work, those people are not your friends and you need to put a wall up. And I'm like, well, how do you expect people to trust you if you don't trust other people? It's kind of yeah. like what came first, the chicken or the egg, right? So we, and I'm not saying you have to share your deepest, darkest, you know, traumas and secrets, but talk yeah. about something outside of work that you can, you know, have some common ground with other people on. Exactly. You know, I, what, what I loved about the book is you've got this uh, diagram of this table that delineates victim versus victor. And yeah. you start yeah. to say the conversation individually, but also collectively must move from victim to victor. Talk me a little bit around that table for the benefit of, of people who are listening in. Well, I know for a lot of people of color, you know, there's a lot of data out here that, you know, I just saw something that um, I think McKinsey put out saying it's going to be 95 years before Black people can achieve parity in the corporate space. <laughs> and, and look, I'm, I'm sure that that information is true, but you can read some of these stats and then we have conversations with each other you know, and you talk about the man and the system and you can start to feel like, what's the point? Like, there's nothing I can do. It is what it is, you know, and, and my belief is that, you know, I do think systems have to be dismantled. I don't disagree with that at all. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done, but I do think there are things that we could be doing differently, you know, in order to impact our experience. I don't feel like we're completely powerless. I definitely think there are things that we can do, you know, knowing ourselves is one, you know, like I said, one area, learning how to get along with other kinds of people, building relationships with other people, how we show up at work, how we communicate, how we deliver, like these are things that are within our control. And I just, you yeah. know, I think personally, I, I like to focus on that locus of control as opposed to what's outside of it. So I focus on what is it I have complete control over and what yeah. is it that I can influence? And that's honestly where I focus my attention. The rest of it, I just have to let go because all it'll do is kind of demoralize me and probably paralyze me, you know, when I start thinking about all the things that are outside of my control. Yeah. And so, look, I mean, one of the things that's paralyzing to many colleagues and many people that I work with is, and you, you refer to it extensively in the book, is the limiting self-belief, the imposter yeah. syndrome around why me? How did I get this? And one of the reasons for this, I often say, is because... Many of us have grown up in communities where our peers and young people who studied with us and perhaps were intellectually better than us, Absolutely. perhaps because of the system or various reasons or because of finance, were unable to grow in that system. And so yeah. I often say when I go back to the community I grew up in, it's really difficult for me because, uh, you know, I then question and, and you, you deal very practically with this limiting self-belief and imposter syndrome. Give us all that practical perspective that you bring into the room or into the book. So, I mean, I, I think some of it, and this comes back to knowing ourselves, right? Um, I mean, I give an example in the book. When I was in high school, I think my, probably my second year in high school, I took this standardized test and I did really well on it. And unbeknownst to me, the, the organization that administered the test sent my test scores to all these different colleges and universities. And they started writing me letters saying, you know, you did really well on this test. You should think about applying. And I literally, Abdullah, I read the letters and I thought, oh, this is so nice. It's like, a, I was like, oh, it's a courtesy letter. Like they're not really serious about me applying because people like me yeah. don't go to schools like that because some of them were yeah. Ivy League schools. And I literally put the letters in a drawer. I was like, I'm going to show those letters to my children. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is my 15, 16 year old mind, you know? And it just goes to show you how powerful our minds are, right? Oh. I mean, the people who are admitting people into these prestigious universities have written me a letter and told me to apply, but I didn't believe it. I just didn't believe it. 
I, sure. I, I made all kinds of excuses why they would have sent me that. And none of them had you know, anything to do with the fact that I actually could be qualified to get in. And so that I, I just share that example in the book and also with you now, because I just want people to understand how powerful our minds are and, and how yeah. we need yeah. to challenge ourselves in terms of how we think and some of the things we say to ourselves. And, and I still do that to this day. You know, if I say to myself, okay, Carrie, you can either do this or that. And I'm like, uh-uh, how can we get a little bit of both? How can we get all of both? How could I, you know, if I set a goal and say, you know, I want to, you know, let's say if I was running my own business, okay, I want to make a thousand dollars. Okay, why not make it five? Why not make it 10? You know what I mean? I just constantly am challenging myself. I've just kind of trained myself to challenge myself on some of these limiting beliefs that I have. And I think Yo, that's I mean, the book you... over time though. I mean, in the book, Carrie, you speak about the fact that you never imagined, uh, you know, getting into Harvard Business School or Absolutely. coming to South Africa or uh, doing the type of work that you do and working in the organizations. And it's reminded me of an interview that I had last week where somebody asked me, when you were in school, did you imagine doing the things that you do? And I said, you know, yeah. in the absence of role models or this vision, I, I never knew that this kind of a life existed. I never knew that these possibilities were there. For me, it was just find a job and survive. And, and part yeah. of that is really this ability to, as you say, create a, a different picture or a different vision. And, and also the responsibility on many of us to become the role models to many of the next generation of young people in the workplaces, but also in our communities, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, and I mean, that's part of the reason I wrote the book is I feel like I've gotten exposed to just so many interesting concepts that have really just shaped how I think. But I mean, I'll be honest, a lot of these concepts were introduced to me when I was in these very elite spaces. Like when I was at Harvard Business School, I took a class my second year called self-assessment and career development. And that was the first time I asked myself, why had I made some of the decisions I'd made in terms of my career? Um, or going, you know, working at Deloitte, working at McKinsey, like the things that you that I learned there, even now working at Corn Ferry. And I'm like, you think about all the hurdles that people have to cross to get into these organizations. You got to do well in high school, do well in university, do well in graduate school, <laughs> you know, do well in the job interview in order to get this information. And I just wanted to democratize the access to it. I'm like, you don't have to go to Harvard Business School or work at Corn Ferry to get access to some of these, some of this information, you know. And so I wanted to just, I wanted to share what it is I've learned and what I've been exposed to to help people. Lovely. I want to bring in a few people from the, from the audience, people who've asked some questions. So I'm going to ask that you unmute yourself as I call you. I see some very dear friends and I want to actually pick on somebody who hasn't asked the question, but she said, agreed, Carice is sharing pearls of wisdom that can be used in so many contexts. She says she loves the continuum of authenticity and it resonates a lot with her. But I'm going to call in Ms. Kai Cooks Chisano. She's a dear friend, somebody who's mentored oh, me for yeah. many years. And you probably know Kai as well, uh, similar yeah. American background, but doing some incredible work in Southern Africa. So Kai, let me, let me hand the floor to you and give you some uh, perspective. And then I'll call Marius Oosthuizen after that. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, <laughs> Abdullah, it's so great to see you. And Karis, just to take this opportunity to say I'm very, very proud of you and for you. <laughs> I think yeah. it's so important to empower your words. What I wrote in the comments, and I wrote it very quickly because I was so excited to see you and I was taking notes and I'm saying, these are pearls that you're giving us. Excellence doesn't happen in a vacuum. Deal with the F word, the continuum of, of authenticity, you know, dealing with the levels where you're working at. And I'm like, this isn't just for young professionals. You yeah, should be sure. speaking at our, I mean, we just had the matric results. So I'm, I'm just very grateful. I'm glad that Gibbs is doing that. I mean, I've worked with Abdullah for years and I'm gonna show my age when Abdullah was um, a young up and coming person at Model UN, then he stared that helm. And I've just followed his career with such pride. And I know his love for community. And you know, one last secret before I yield the floor. I've called on him to support matriculants. I know he's gonna blush. And he financially supported anonymously. And then he said, Kai, what else can I do? So, I mean, wow. having two people that I have great respect for, it's such an honor. And thank you, Abdullah. Thank you, Karis. Keep doing what you're doing. I'm proud for you and of you. <laughs> thank you so much, Kai. 
Lovely. Uh, Thank you so much, Kai. And I think you you played such a massive role in terms of the development of many of us. And so I, I, when I saw your name, I was really excited. Um, let me let me go to Marius. Uh, Marius uh, is a head of the Center for Leadership and Dialogue, but has a very interesting question. Uh, Marius, I'm going to ask you to, to unmute and bring yourself into the conversation. I'd love for you to, to ask that question to Carice. Uh, thank you, Abdullah, and uh, thank you for this wonderful conversation. I'm just inspired by the vulnerability with which you've shared and the deep reflections of your own experiences. My question is about uh, how we manage ego as rising stars. And so on the one hand, uh, there's this pressure to deal with race relations and all kinds of expectations. But on the other hand, you know, as young, talented people, there's a level of confidence and one has to show that confidence. How have you thought about managing ego in the process? Thank you. Thank you for that question, Marius. I think for me, you know, I'm naturally probably a person who suffers from a fair amount of self-doubt. <laughs> so I'm always questioning myself and always, you know, looking at other people who are so much further ahead of me. So that, I think that helps on, sometimes on, on the ego, right? Is to recognize like, hey, you, you've done some great things, but you can go so much further. You can learn so much more. And I think that's one thing that helps. But I also think for me, you know, on the topic of confidence, you know, if I understand like that I'm a worthy person, I think your worth and value needs to come from just being a human being on the planet, as opposed to, oh, I, I'm doing so well at work, um, you know, because tomorrow you can get some horrible feedback. Or you can make a really big mistake. And then where does your confidence go then? So I think, and, and that's something I talk about in my book too, is that because I was always this rock star from a grades perspective, um, I, a lot of my self-worth was wrapped up in achievement. And then my first job out of undergrad where I was getting the free breakfast and the free lunch and dinner, I wasn't that good at that job. <laughs> and so I had a, a existential crisis where I was like, well, if I'm not performing well, then who am I? What, what value am I adding to the world? And so I think it's important for all of us, not even just young people, but all of us to separate our identity, our self-worth, our self-value from achievement. You know, And we can be excited about the things that we're doing, but we just have to make sure we're not wrapping our whole worth and value because that's when you have people who they get good feedback, they're on a high and they're all happy and, you know, and then they get bad feedback and they're a little monster, you know? <laughs> And that kind of inconsistency, nobody wants to have you on their team and we don't yeah. want to have you as a leader either. So I think we need to find some level of, you know, equilibrium and, and make sure that we're checking ourselves in terms of where we get our worth and value from, because life will definitely teach you, uh, you know, if you, if you put too much value in achievement. Um, yeah. And, and that, that's kind of my take. I don't know, Abdullah, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think exactly the same. Uh, you know, uh, you, you always have these different ebbs and flows in terms of your career. And sometimes you think I've been able to get a handle of a situation until a different perspective comes in. And uh, I think yeah. the last 18 months of COVID have been a good reflection of that. And, you know, maybe I want to bring in Sibusiso Kunene who asks a fascinating question. I mean, Carice, you mentioned that 10% is really what you know, but 70% is on the job training. Uh, and the argument from Sibu Siso is, you know, working remotely. Uh, yeah. I yeah. was joking to a friend the other day, I haven't worn a suit for 11 months. And for before, I'd wear a suit every single day. And my daughter saw me wearing a suit last week because I needed to go and give a talk at one of the banks. And she said, Dad, you look awkward today. I said, what do you mean? She said, no, you're not dressed properly. I said, no, I'm dressed fantastically well. I've got a great suit on. And she said, no, that's not you. Because she's become accustomed to me being different, working from home. And so Sibusisa's point is when we're working remotely, you know, how do we still get some of that on the job training? We don't have the physical connection. Meetings yeah. are all about an agenda. We jump from team scores, team scores. How do we start to integrate some of the important elements of human connection and on the job training? So I'll say, I think it's really two things. Um, in terms of getting on the job training, I think you're just going to have to be more deliberate about it you know, and maybe say to your manager, and this goes back to the concept, you know, of owning your career, which I talk about in the book too. You know, you're going to have to take charge and say to your manager, hey, can we meet once a week? 
and I just walk through the things that I'm working on. Any questions I have, you can give me feedback or give me some coaching. You know, and you set a repeating invite in the calendar and make sure those meetings happen. You know, and if the meetings need to be shifted, hey, it's fine. But at least you you put forth the effort and try to put some structure around getting that that coaching that you that you so desperately need, right? Um, and that feedback as well, and making sure you you come prepared, you come with an agenda. You're very clear about what your priorities are, but also you're checking in with your with your manager to make sure your priorities are aligned with his or her priorities. The second thing I would say in terms of relationship building, you know, because, you know, back when the world was normal, right, you know, we'd run into somebody at the coffee machine or in the restroom, we'd have a bit of a fat chat. And that was a way for us to sort of cultivate our relationships. Well, you know, we don't have that now. But what's wrong with us saying to people, hey, can I grab 15 minutes with you next Tuesday? You bring some tea, I'll bring some coffee and we just catch up. Yeah. Like we can, yeah. we should be doing that. We should actively be doing that. Now, is it a little bit more orchestrated? Not as kind of organic as we would like it to be? Of course it's not, <laughs> but it's necessary because you still need to be building these relationships because at some point we're gonna come out of COVID. Um, yeah. and, we, and even while we're in it, we need to, we, you know, promotions are still happening. People are still getting, you know, bonuses and increases and step up opportunities. So you still need to be building those relationships, even in spite of the, the circumstance in which we find ourselves. Exactly. I mean, meet outside, meet socially distant, but yeah, at least connect. Absolutely. Uh, get out of the building, uh, as I often say. Uh, I'm going to go to Mashudu. Uh, Mashudu has a really great question, and I want to actually build on it. So Mashudu's question, Carice, is, you know, how do you stay mindful about your true worth and your value? in the midst of what he calls, or she calls, constant work pressure, demanding deliverables. And, uh, you know, I sit on the board of GE and our global CEO, Jeff Immelt, was here two years ago, and he said to me, Carice, South Africa has unique keys. He says, I've never seen it in any other country. There are things that are so different in this country, in this environment. And so to build on Mashuda's point, sometimes it's also issues that are happening on social media. There's also issues in terms of family pressure. There's challenges in terms of living in a country with such massive income inequality. And all of this has a, have a big impact on you as an individual. And so the view is, you know, on a good day, work is going smoothly, you feel good, and you like what you do, but then all of this pressure comes and he says, or she says, it eats at you. Uh, and it yeah. puts doubt in your head. So the view is, how do you practice mindful mindfulness in these moments? Mm. I mean, I think one of the keys is you know, to practice mindfulness outside of those moments, you know, you think about how do, how do you start your day? You know, do you immediately reach for the phone and look at email or look at what's happening in the world? Because then immediately you're getting inundated with all this other stuff, as opposed to you kind of setting your intention for your day and being mindful. And I think there are different techniques, right? I think there's meditation. I think there's prayer. Um, you know, having some sort of spiritual base, I think can also help. That's really helped me to understand who I am, you know, in God's eyes, not what the world tells me because the world, you know, as a, as a black female, you know, the world will tell you all kinds of things about everything about you, <laughs> yeah. your skin, your lips, your hips, your hair, everything is not up to standard, you know? And so for me, it's also about just getting quiet being reflective, having these moments where you're feeding yourself messages of positivity, I think is really, really important on a daily basis. Because like you're saying, there's, there's so many messages coming at us. And sometimes I think we also need to limit how much time we spend on social media, how much time we watch news, um, you know. And, and I think the other part would probably be, think about the people you surround yourself with too. I talk about this in, in my book, you know. I, I heard someone say, you know, you can look at your life and, and look at the five people you spend the most time with and I can tell you what kind of life you have. So also think about who are the people you spend time with? Are these people talking about ideas and the future and what their plans are and what, and what we're capable of doing? Or is it somebody who's kind of a negative Nancy, you know, who's always talking about the, the negative and what can't be done and kind of in that victim mindset. So I also think that helps, you know, to think about the people that we surround ourselves with, you know, and what type of news, you know, that we consume as well. Lovely. Uh, last two questions, Carice. Uh, I'm going to also say the following that uh, I chatted to JD and we managed to get two uh, copies that we're going to give to two oh, of you. And thank you. I'm going to do this for somebody who has uh, the best 
view in terms of what do you take out, out of the session. So please feel free to put that into the chat. What is it that really resonated with you in the discussion that Carice and I had together today? And then also a question that I think really encapsulates uh, and has given us as much food for thought in terms of uh, some of the perspectives. So one a view in terms of what do you take out and we as a team will think about what's the best uh, comment in terms of a takeout. Uh, and we'll reach out then to you in terms of making sure that we get it sent across to you. Uh, so what resonated with you, put it in the chat or the Q&A, and then also a, an interesting question. But this takes me to Tandeka's question. Uh, Tandeka speaks about, Carice, the corporate muscles that you speak about in your book. And mm -hmm. one that also resonated with me really well was cultural intelligence. Uh, oh, and so the yeah. view is, and, and Tandeka's point is, how do you go about equipping yourself with this cultural or corporate muscle, cultural intelligence, as we call it? Um, so I think there's a there's a couple things, right? So I talk about there's a professor. Um, I think he's he's late now, but Hofstetter. So he has yeah. a cultural intelligence framework. So I, it's kind of you know it's kind of like emotional intelligence in the sense it needs to start with you. So you need to really examine what are the elements of your own culture. You know when you think about um, hierarchy and authority and power distance, right? So really examining your own culture. And then I think that helps you start to examine the culture in which you're working and to see where those potential clashes might be. Because oftentimes what, what I think happens is we come into an, envi an environment with our own cultural filter or lens, and then we judge the culture in which we're working because it doesn't measure up to our own culture. But we need to understand that culture is a lens. It's not, a, it's not objective. You know, your culture is not better than mine or worse than mine and vice versa. So I think it's just about understanding what's the lens that we come into situations with and, and what, you know, culture are we in? And, and I'll even say like for me, even the management consulting firms, like I worked at McKinsey, but I've done freelance work for Bain. Their cultures are very, very different. What works at McKinsey does not work at Bain and what works at Bain does not work at McKinsey. So it's, you know, you can't just say like, okay, well, I work in management consulting. So this way of being works in, in, in any environment in that space. It's not true. You really got to understand how does this place work from a communication style, handling conflict, how people do their work, how people collaborate, and then try to think about, okay, how can I fit into this culture in an authentic way? I don't think it's about turning yourself into someone that you're not, but I think it is about being willing to compromise on certain things. Um, I know like even the concept of personal branding, people will say, you know, and I'll be honest, the first time I heard the term personal branding, I thought it was total rubbish. <laughs> I was like, I'm not going to fit into this box. I'm not going to conform. But when you realize personal branding is all about what are the emotions that I want to evoke when I'm not in the room? What words do I want to come to mind when somebody says carries? Now, how can I show up in a way that matters in this environment and that matters to me so that, you know, I can build the kind of personal brand that I want to. So it, for me, it's all about being thoughtful about how you show up. And the way Abdullah shows up may not be the way I show up because we're different people and we have different personalities. I don't think we all have to do the same thing, but it is about figuring out how do you want to shape your brand? Because look, you're going to have a brand whether you want one or not. Yep. So you might as well shape it. Um, but do it in a context and in a way that adds value in that space and that's also authentic to who you are. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the last part of your book speaks beautifully about this issue of personal branding and building a brand that resonates with you, but also the external context. I'm going to take in the last question and I'm going to integrate the question by uh, my colleague Tato Mota and also Rachel. Uh, so Tato speaks about the fact that sometimes it's very difficult to be able to enter specific workplaces because they're deliberately exclusionary. So she speaks about the mm. fact that, you know, interviews are, are done uh, in Afrikaans in a language that perhaps she's not comfortable with. And it becomes uh, a way for them, you know, for young experience, young black people to feel intimidated and fearful. And then Rachel's point, which pulls on that is the, the challenge of coming into a new environment, coming with fantastic new ideas, but then they get blocked in the workplace uh, yeah. for various reasons. Perhaps you're not at the right level or you don't have a certain title or people take those ideas and they get implemented without you getting acknowledged. How would you manage some of these complexities, Carice? I'll start with your first question first. And this is just me, right? And obviously I don't know your situation, but if I was to walk into an interview and they're unwilling to either speak in English, you know, um, 
I would probably, you know, I would go through with the interview out of courtesy and professionalism, but that for me is a real red flag. Is that a place I really want to work at, to be honest? Yep. It, is that an inclusive environment? Because if there, you, you think about it, it's like an interview is like a first date. So somebody's behaving badly on a first date, <laughs> it's all it's all downhill from there. <laughs> it's not going to get any better. It's only going to get I behaved badly on my first date and, and I actually got married to my wife. Huh? <laughs> Your story is an exception, but I mean, yeah, I, I just think, you know, you might want to reconsider if that's a place you really want to work. Exactly. Yeah. And know that, you know, you do have choice and you do have agency. I think the, the second question about, you know, I, I had a, and I mentioned this in my book too, that I worked for someone when I worked at, at the public school district who was very resistant to my ideas. And I had these blinders on at the time where I thought, well, look, my ideas are strong enough. I don't need to have a relationship with him. I don't need to take a step back and ask why he's being resistant. I'm just going to power through. And that was one of the biggest mistakes I've ever made. I, I, what I didn't realize was that this man had been demoted before I came. And there was all this hype about me. And I think he felt really threatened. And so that's why he was very resistant to my ideas. So I think that's why having relationships with people is really important. You know, really trying to understand what's important to people, what what um, style of influencing works with them. Everybody's not influenced by the same thing. And your ideas might be great, but the way you're communicating them. So you might want to think about, you know, there are some people who are influenced by data. Some people are influenced by you telling a story. Some people want to, you know, hear the vision. Some people want to know, OK, walk me step by step how I'm going to do this. You know, so you've got, that's why you've got to spend time getting to know people to figure out what style of influencing works with them. And then you can communicate your ideas in a way that resonates with those people. Because, you know, our ideas, like I said, um, can be fantastic, but if we don't communicate them in the right way, it won't matter. Or if we don't speak to people in a way that communicates what's in it for them. Your idea is great, but how is this going to help me? People inherently, you know, we're motivated by self-interest. <laughs> so you got to communicate your ideas in a way that also speaks to what that person is trying to accomplish and what matters to that person. Lovely. Teresa, I was going to close off, but I have a question that I really want to bring into this conversation, and I'm going to throw it at you. It's a question by Mercy uh, because it speaks to me on so many levels. What is the most significant leadership advice or pointers you would give to a single mother, a career person, uh, career woman for purposes of growth? Piece of advice. I think my, my piece of advice would be figure out what matters to you. And obviously, you know, your child or your children matter to you. Figure out, you know, what, what is it that you want to achieve from a career perspective? And then be very strategic about how you go about managing both of those. I do think it's possible for you to, you know, and I know a lot of women who have children and are successful in their careers. But it's about figuring out, like I said, what's important to you, evaluating opportunities based on those values, and then figuring out how do you strategically use your time to speak to everything that's important to you. I'll give you an example. Um, when I was in business school, there was a lady that came to speak. She was a CEO of a company. She had a child and she was married. And she says, those are my three priorities, my husband, my child, my career. If you look, if you look at my diary, my calendar, you can tell immediately what's important to me. If, if, if an opportunity comes up that doesn't fit into those three priorities, I don't do it. She's like, I don't have the cleanest house. If you come over to my house to hang out, we're ordering takeout. I'm not cooking for you. you know. So she's very clear about what her priorities are. Um, and, and even on the strategic time investment, you know, if you think about this is when the world was still open, but if there are certain networking events, maybe you don't go to everything because you don't have time to go to everything. But think about, okay, which events are going to be the ones that are probably most beneficial for what I'm trying to achieve? Which events are going to have the people that, uh, you know, I really want to build relationships with? And let me go to those events, as opposed to I go to everything, right? So it's just, I think you just have to be more thoughtful, the more you have to juggle, but I totally think it's possible for you to, you know, achieve your professional and your personal goals at the same time. Yeah, I think that's such a beautiful point. You know, I took a decision. I, I've got three kids, Teresa, a four-year-old boy, a six-year-old girl, and an eight-year-old girl. And my girl was born in 2012. And I took a decision at the time that I'm going to spend a lot more time not traveling and at home. And there's always these conflicting priorities. There's so yeah. many dinners with executives and CEOs, and I turned them down. And 
a friend of, uh, often jokes with me and says, what do you do when you turn these things down? I said, I come home, I switch off my phone and I play hide and seek with kids. And I gain, I think, as much, or you actually I gain more than I would have gained from some dinner. And you're right, it's really about being able to put the priorities down, which are important. Yeah, 100%. absolutely. Uh, Therese, I'm going, to, I'm going to read out some of the key takeouts, and then I'm going to do something that's different in terms of thanking you. But let me let me read some of the takeouts. Adele Foster's takeout is uh, that really hit hard for her was the 70-20-10 rule. It's 10% education, 90% who you surround yourself with, where you work, and what work what what work what you work on. Um, a takeout from Tato is that if the first date doesn't work, then as Abdullah has suggested, definitely try it a second time. Uh, a takeout from my from my dear friend Kai um, is intelligence isn't enough. Who am I? How do I show up as my authentic self in all contexts? Uh, how can I use this information today to add to my personal roadmap? And very importantly, how do I deal with words when I work with children? So my word from the session, according to Kai, from her for, for her is authenticity. It's collaboration. It's mindfulness and it's relationships. And she she really thanks you for sharing your knowledge and your time. And she's going to put it into her vision board. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Uh, uh, a takeout from uh, Teboho is the continuum of authenticity, which definitely grabbed uh, his attention. He says, I guess it helps us accommodate other cultures in relation to our own personal cultures. And this really makes the workplace a more manageable, a pleasant, but also, I think, a culturally diverse and exciting place to be in, which is so important. Nadine. Um, and uh, really thanking you, and she, she can't wait for the launch of the book. Uh, Tandeka, what resonates with me is the discussion is the importance of trying to understand the environment uh, in terms of the workplace structure, and the importance of understanding before being tried, before trying to be understood. And so to, how do you communicate in terms of uh, where we are? So what I think is important, and there are many, many other takeaways that I'm gonna put together and share with Therese, but I really want to take this opportunity to thank all of you uh, for your inputs, for participating, for putting some beautiful takeouts. For me, what I loved about the book, Therese, uh, is uh, the fact that it was practically written. Uh, I was able to put into my journal things that speak to me and things that I will implement. So I'm really going to encourage you, even if you're not one of the two people, to go out and to get Therese's book. Uh, it's a beautiful read. It really speaks to uh, her career, but also, as I said, uh, a very nice way of putting it. How do you set intentions? How do you build a personal brand? How do you manage your emotions and your words? How do you express self, self, self authentically? And so, Karis, traditionally, if we were together in a room, I'd be able to come across and do a personal thank you. But I'm going to break tradition today because I can't do that. I'm going to ask all of you to unmute yourself um, and to jointly, uh, jointly uh, join me in terms of thanking Karis for your vulnerability, for your authenticity, for sharing openly with us, and for really giving us a, a fascinating start to this Wednesday morning. So I'm going to ask you all to unmute and to join me in thanking Therese. And if you want to switch on your camera, please feel free to do that. But really, a chance to be able to thank Therese on behalf of all of us in the session today. Thank you very much.